Master, tell us, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah and will deceive many. Then many will fall away and they will betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. John. John. Lord. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Welcome to all my viewers to this to the series of the book of Revelation. We are moving into our second episode where in today's episode we are going to be discussing about the seven letters to the seven churches as given in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 and then I'm going to just introduce you to the throne room of God and uh, uh, where John is taken up to the throne room of God that is Revelation chapter 4 verses 2 and just introduce you into uh, what is the rapture and the in the next episode that is the third episode we'll be discussing about what happens to believers in the throne room uh, in the heavenlies when the church is taken up in rapture and what happens on earth where the tribulation period of seven years begin uh, however that will be discussed in detail in the next episode this episode is mainly going to be focusing on the seven letters to the seven churches, which is very, very important for all of us, because this is not just a message to the uh, to the little churches which existed during that time, but this is for uh, a, a futuristic message to the churches and also to individuals who fall under that category. Uh, and uh, so here that we're going to discuss each of the churches where we know that five churches were uh, commended. Uh, sorry, I always get it wrong. The five churches get uh, were condemned and only the two churches did he actually commend for their works. Right. So uh, we're going we're going to go into that in detail and uh, we will start off with the Church of Ephesus, uh, who, where John was the pastor for the Church of Ephesus and what uh, the, what uh, Jesus had to say to the church of Ephesus. What, what is interesting in the first is uh, on the church of Ephesus is he says uh, Jesus sees everything that is going on. He knows what is in their hearts and how they serve him. Now that's very scary when you think about it that Jesus knows what you're doing in the church. Uh, what is going on there so as he addresses the church of Ephesus he says he's addressing the pastor of this church and he says I know thy works thy labor thy patience you you you, you cannot bear that those who are evil you have tested those who are being apostles you found them liars you persevered and the patience you, you are labored for my name's sake but not become weary now this church is as a flagship church i would call it right uh, it's 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 a church which is so doctrinally or theologically right but yet jesus has says nevertheless i have this against against you right he says you have left your first law okay they didn't kind of lose it they deliberately turned away from it uh, they left the first law now, what is this first law uh, that he's talking about? The first law is the love for Jesus Christ. When you come to Jesus Christ and believed in him and trusted in him, the one who died on the cross for their sins. But over time, they, they kind of uh, were kind of trying to be theologically correct. They, but their love were diminishing. They were busy. They were working for the Lord. They were kind of running in the spirit. 
they had uh, ensured that the theological uh, theological doctrines were right but they had forgotten their first law they didn't kind of lose it but they've forgotten their first law they had all the right doctrines they knew the right things but they had fallen away in their love and compassion for Jesus Christ so that's a great warning for all of us today because we do, should not allow other things to come in and replace our love for Jesus Christ so it says uh, over here in all to, to not only the church of Israel, but to all the churches, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear the Spirit says, this is the saying in Revelation 2 7, to him who overcomes, I will grant to, of the, uh, to eat of the tree of life. Now, uh, here there is this word that is uh, talking about, in, about overcomer. Now, what is uh, the definition of an overcomer? So, a lot of people wonder whether it is a special task of uh, a special type of Christians or uh, for those who are, uh, are they good enough to be an overcomer? When you come across a word called overcomer from the Bible, it says that, uh, one. F when, let the Bible define it. It says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, it says, for everyone born of God overcomes the world this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is that who overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So what that means is all of us are overcomers. And when you think about it, when you look at all the different rewards that the, uh, ch the given to the people in the seven churches, those things can be said to be true to all Christians. For example, there's a statement in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. There's a one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. We, no Christian is going to experience a second death, which has absolutely no power. So, overcomer is a one who's born of God. That means it means all Christians. And so, so we, we now go into Smyrna. And when you look into Smyrna, they have suffered persecution. So in Revelation 2.10, it says, Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. So now, so now we know about the health, wealth and prosperity gospel. When we get these little statements, this is going to shake them. And because when they say, and you will have tribulation for 10 days, be faithful unto death. That's what is turning in Revelation 2.10. Now, it has gone through the centuries uh, that so many churches all over the world have been persecuted and died. <clears throat> what is what was amazing about Smyrna was there was John's personal disciple Polycarp. Generation later would be burnt alive for his faith in Christ, and he would refuse to give up his faith in Christ, and for that he had to die a martyr. And as late as early 20th century, 20,000 Christians were martyred in Smyrna and uh, modern day, which is a modern day Ismia. Christians are facing persecutions all over the world. And when you, especially, especially those in, uh, in the Middle Eastern countries who are going through a lot of persecution, there's a lot of persecution going around uh, for all of the all of the believers around the world for standing on their faith in Christ. But Jesus said, whoever confess me before men, I'll also confess before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me, Jesus says, before men, I'll also deny before my father who is in heaven. So Matthew 10, 32, chapter 10, verse 32 to 33 talks about that. Uh, talks about this uh, statement. So now, when you are a pastor of, of a large church, when you listen to all this that is happening, we need what strikes us is, as a leader in a church, whether you're a pastor or a leader, we need to listen to this, uh, or uh, when you study this book of Revelation on what is uh, happening uh, and what is what condemnation he has for these churches, we need to, uh, think, think about it and study it in detail and uh, when you see in the letters to the church he, he keeps on telling in, to all these seven churches I know your deeds I know your deeds 
to Smyrna in Pergamum. He says, I know where you dwell. Thyatria, he says, I know your deeds. Sardis, he says, I know your deeds. He keeps on saying, I know your deeds, I know your deeds, I know your deeds. So it's very important for us to really get serious about this and know where we stand and whatever we need to do. We, we can't fool Jesus because he knows everything and we need to understand him very well. We need to read these letters to the seven churches and whatever the Lord commands, uh, we need to emulate the things the Lord commands and follow it as an example. And when we see those condemnation, we need to uh, re, re uh, examine our church, our faith, our doctrines. Now we look into the uh, church at Pergamum. Now before we go into that, uh, it's very important for, for us to know, again I'm telling you, that Jesus comes to every church on a Sunday. He knows all the people in the church and he knows each and every one of us individually. He knows what is your works and he knows what you're thinking of. Now, if you have a compromised faith or you are just coming to church to get your worldly desires and ambitions done, he knows your selfish attitude. He knows your lukewarm attitude. He knows that once you get your things done, your prayers answered, you're going to stop coming to church. So he knows everything. In the seven letters to uh, the seven churches, he keeps on saying that, let them who have hear, let him hear what the Lord has to say to these churches. And he rewards, he says, I will reward you if you are a faithful and if you are, a, if you are an overcomer of all these that you have uh, gone through. Now, so uh, we, we, look, we looked at two churches and now we move to the church of Pergamium and uh, there are uh, three, three, four aspects we need to discuss on it. One is uh, he talks about Satan's throne, he talks about the doctrine of Balaam and he talks about Nicolaitan. What is exactly all that we're going to see right now as we read from Revelation chapter 2 verses 11 to 15. When you look at uh, Revelation chapter 2 verses 12 to 15, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, I write, These things say he who has the sharp two-edged sword. We know that is uh, Jesus Christ. He says, I know your works, as I said, and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Now, I want to stop there, right there, Satan's throne. What is he uh, mentioning there of Satan's throne? First of all, there were two things that were happening. That was they used to worship the emperors during that time. So they used to worship uh, Caesar and so everybody was supposed to bow down to Caesar and uh, they used to praise his name and uh, uh, bow, bow, bow themselves to Caesar. But more than that, there was a giant deity they used to worship uh, and it was known as the god Zeus there during that time. And that is why Jesus says uh, in, in, in that church, unfortunately, uh, they 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 used to have a hybrid mix of such deity worship going on, which was a uh, Roman god Zeus that they used to worship. So this is why he says Satan's throne is there. Now this is also a message to the future churches that some of these churches have uh, satanic doctrines uh, in the church, which has mixed up and become hybrid in the church, and the churches have not noticed that. That churches have some kind of spirituality. They they claim it to be the Holy Spirit, but it need not be the Holy Spirit. It has to be uh, familiar spirits which mimic the spirit of uh, the mimic the Holy Spirit. But it is actually satanic spirit, and there's in in fact occult practices in the churches today. So I believe that this is a warning to the church in Pergamos during that time. But also such occult practices is existing in the Christian churches today. Then he goes on to say, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you. And Antipas uh, was, uh, John had made Antipas to be the bishop at Pergamus, but he was killed by the during the reign of Domitian em Roman Emperor. He was put in a brass ball and he was baked to death. Now, uh, you know, do, uh, uh, th this is why he say, he talks about Antipas there. And uh, then he goes on to moves on to say about uh, uh, he, he goes on to say about the doctrine of Balaam. He says, and I have a few things against you because you have there also hold an, uh, hold, uh, be, uh, hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Now, what was this doctrine of Balaam? Doctrine of Balaam was uh, 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 it was uh, the, the, what happened was 
Uh, he used to talk about, uh, they used to make the Moabite woman to seduce Israeli men into intermarriage, which was a great violation of God's uh, uh, law. And this was being practiced during that time uh, at the church in Pergamos. And that was uh, not only that, they were made to sac sacrifice to idols and to, to commit sexual immorality. And this is a, a message to uh, to the doctrine of Nicolaitans who also practiced the style of self-gratification, self-indulgence and sexual immorality in the church. I, I believe that uh, there is a, there are a lot of uh, sexual immorality cases happening in our churches today. And this is a warning to all of them to stay uh, clean uh, and stop involving in such sexual immorality practices. Apart from all that, uh, there is a, we have to warn ourselves and ensure that such satanic doctrine, uh, occult practices, spirituality and all sorts of um, mysticism entering into the church is defiling uh, it is it's a great defilement to the doctrine of uh, god god's law and uh, it is definite a definite warning to not only the church at that point of time of dispensation dispensation but also to our time right now we come into the book of Revelation chapter 2 verses 19 to 21. We are going to do the church of theatre. Now he says in this that I know your works, love, service, faith and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. And then he mentions here about Jezebel. He says, because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immortal immorality and she did not repent. What is, what is he trying to uh, trying to communicate to this uh, church at Theatria. That's what we're going to look at. You see who is Jezebel. Uh, well, Jezebel is uh, the wife of uh, King Ahab and she was a Phoenician queen. She was also an idol worshipper. She came in and corrupted the, the husband and the nation of Israel. So the name Jezebel, uh, it, it, we don't know if that was a really the name of the woman, but it's conjuring up the idea that what she represents in the church of theatre. What's interesting is even though it condemns uh, Jezebel, it talks about how, how can you tolerate the woman of Jezebel. So it's basically a news, uh, it, it is pointing at the leaders that they are tolerating the false teaching of this woman, uh, this false teaching. So the real problem at the church of theatre was it was a tolerant, a tolerant church tolerating of false teaching. We all want to be tolerant, but we do not want to be to uh, tolerant to false uh, false teaching or false doctrine. So now he talks about the dead church, the church of Sardis. We are coming going to the church of Sardis right now. That's Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 to 3. Now it says in that, and to the angel of the church in Sardis, he says, These things he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but actually you are dead. Now be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will know what hour I will come upon you. Now see the church of Sardis was basically, uh, Sardis itself was uh, the, during the ancient times it was the capital of Asia Minor. And this city was kind of dead. Now this particular church is describing outside it has a name that it is very much alive uh, going church but there's nothing happening in that church basically the church is dead spiritually dead nobody is coming to christ the gospel is not being preached nobody is bothered about uh, glorifying the kingdom of god they just have this great name and fame of being a vibrant church where the high uh, in the society come and uh, worship and uh, they they part themselves but there's nothing happening there's no growth of the kingdom of god there is no spreading of the gospel there's no preaching of the gospel that is taking place it is just 
simply dead. So Jesus is warning the church of Sardis and saying that I will come to you at any time, at any time, and I will take away the candlestick from you if you do not uh, realize your mistake and you do not wake up to this call that I have given. So that is what he wants to the church of Sardis. There are so many such churches at our present time. And uh, if they have been studying the book of Revelation, they need to take this note very seriously. Now we come to the church of Philadelphia. Now this is one of the churches which uh, uh, Jesus commends. Uh, and it's called the faithful church. And there's a promise uh, which is very, uh, this is, there's a promise which points towards the fact that Jesus will remove the church especially those who are faithful and obedient to his commandments before the hour of trial. Let's read that. Revelation chapter 3 verses 10 to 11. It talks about Church of Philadelphia. He says, Because you have kept my command to perceive, I also will keep you from the hour of trial. He's talking about uh, the tribulation period. Okay, So which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So he's talking about the coming wrath and judgment of God. And he says, Behold, I am com coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. That's a very powerful and strong statement there. Jesus is very, uh, very strongly, he says that um, I will keep you from the hour of trial. Because there is something that is coming. Now, some Bible scholars say, no, he, they, he was saying, he was only telling it to the Church of Philadelphia. He was not telling it to the Church of Philadelphia. He was also telling it to all the other churches because he says, "Let them who have a ear to hear, ear to hear this with my voice. Let them hear and be obedient to what I have to say." He's telling this not to just one church. He's telling to all these other churches that there is a coming wrath, and because you are the faithful church, hold on. Because I am coming quickly. He says in the very next verse, Behold, I am coming quickly. That is verse 11. So hold fast to what you have and uh, no, so that no one can take your crown. Now these are the few churches except for Church of Sardis and Church of Philadelphia was the only church which uh, Jesus uh, commends and appreciates their work and uh, asks them to hold on. Now Sardis was a church which was persecuted and Philadelphia was a church which were faithful to his call and uh, so it is so very obvious that uh, which supports the pre-tribulation rapture that the rapture of the church will take place before the, the tribulation and that is why in the very next verse he says behold I'm coming quickly hold fast what you have so that no one may take your crown so we go now finally to the last church the seventh church the church of Laodicea now, that this church is particularly mentioned the last for a particular reason, because towards the end times, just before the rapture, most of the churches will tend to get lukewarm. And that's what is happening nowadays. So let me just read Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 to 16. It says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I would vomit you, he uses the straw, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. Now, Jesus is very, uh, is not that uh, the lamb that came to be slain, the suffering Messiah, he is coming as a judge and his words are quite strong. And uh, there is, I see there is judgment and discipline. Jesus cannot tolerate a lukewarm believer nor a lukewarm church. He says, I don't mind you being cold. Or not, neither be or being hot, but I can't tolerate being lukewarm. Now, in this particular church of Laodicea, uh, there used to be um, there used to be a place called, called Colosse where, where, where there was cold water, and there was a place where there's uh, there's hot springs in that same location. Uh, and now, what happens was where the water used to come, uh, the water supply used to come to this uh, church. It used to be lukewarm. Now, well, he uses that phrase uh, uh, talking about the church, and but he compares it to the spiritual state of that church during that time, uh, the church of Laodicea, which was a lukewarm church. They were neither cold nor hot. And Jesus makes it very strong in his words. He says, I want to vomit you out of my mouth. We need to know that we have to stay and keep our fire burning 
not be lukewarm in our approach, in our faith, but stay strong and uh, uh, ignite and light the fire and uh, uh, be strong in our faith. Do not be, do not shake up, or do not be shaken by what is happening around us. We continue to wait for his coming. Uh, he promises to the church of Philadelphia that he shall remove us or move us out of here before the wrath and judgment falls upon the earth. Clearly, he says, behold, I'm coming soon. Hold on to, uh, for you will receive your crown. But he says, uh, the final last message to the seven churches, do not be lukewarm. I don't mind you being cold or hot, but not lukewarm. So we need to take this seriously and uh, know that you might be a church which is uh, where, where very wealthy people come to the church. Uh, it seems to be a very prosperous church. But he says, also mentions the fact that this church is actually blind. They, they, it looks like they have eyes to see, but actually in reality they are blind. Now it's again referring to the fact that there was a hospital, uh, an eye hospital in the same place, Laodicea, where they used to treat the blind people. And they used to manufacture black woolen, woolen garments uh, in this particular uh, in this particular place of Laodicea. Now that's not relevant right now. We just uh, I'm just cut uh, taking just the relevant points as a Christian. We need to know from these seven messages that do not be lukewarm. Keep your fire burning. Stay strong in your faith. Now, what's going to happen in the uh, end of this? This is the end of this uh, second episode. But the next, that is the third episode, we're going to be talking about the rapture. We're going to be talking about the difference between rapture and second coming. We're going to look into the throne room of God. What is happening in the throne room of God? What is the rewards that the believers get, receive in the form of crowns? There are five crowns that believers will receive. And the 21 elders around. And we're going to also talk about... Uh, the rapture, of course, uh, difference between rapture and second coming. And there is a seal, seven seal uh, scroll with, with, with Jesus and which only Jesus can uh, open that, uh, which, which is the earth's title deed. Nobody else is qualified enough to receive it. So don't miss this this uh, in the ne very next episode, the third episode where we talk about the throne room of God, the difference between rapture and second coming and the scroll that is in Jesus' hand, which is the earth's title deed.